Hello everyone and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and thank you for joining me for this December Reflections video. Um, I have a bunch of things to talk about and I will put timestamps down below so that you can jump around from uh, topic to topic. Um, I'll be starting with kind of uh, tarot and metaphysical items that I received for gifts um, and then we'll work our way around into sort of uh, other interests I've had, um, books that I've been reading, and then just sort of plans for 2022. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get down on the table and look at some uh, gifts that I received. So these are not, um, embarrassingly, these are not all of the things that I received uh, in December. Um, it was it was quite uh, quite abundant um, in terms of gifts, but uh, these are kind of all the ones I thought you might be interested in. And I'll start with this um, set of things here. This is actually is not all the pieces of it, but a very good uh, friend of mine, who I met through Tarot, actually got me this customized mala making kit. Um, the person, uh, Teresa Mayville, uh, calls herself a malaologist, um, and she has this malaology uh, business. She's got this Etsy shop here, which you can look up, and I'll also link to it in the notes below. Um, and of course, Buddhists are not the only um, group of people that use mala. Um, it's uh, Prayer bead, beads of this type are used in a number of different practices around the world. Um, and it's not even dissimilar from using a rosary to count your prayers. Um, but this is a really cool kit because you can customize it to the person. Um, if you follow crystal uh, crystallology, crystal work, um, you can pick out different crystals to use. I'm going to put this little guy down here too. Um, so based on that person's, you know, maybe what they need for their supporting energy. So the way that this particular kit comes, it comes with a bunch of different pieces, including some that I don't have out in front of me. Um, some crystals and some incense um, and instructions for making anointing oils, um, which I tend not to do. Um, just I found them, I find them a little bit overpowering, but there's a nice stub of incense in here that I can just burn. Um, and then very detailed instructions, multiple pages of instructions, as well as links to videos for how to actually create the mala, how to tie the knots um, and thread the beads and all of that, and create a tassel and all those things. And the different parts of the mala um, and the numerology and why we have 108 beads as opposed to some other number of beads. Um, and all those things. So um, yeah, check check out her website uh, and you can see sort of more of what she offers. Um, I think she offers pre-made malas as well, but it's, it's fun for um, an aspiring practitioner to be able to use, um, to, to make one myself. So for myself. So that's, that's really cool. So thank you, friend. Uh, you know who you are. Um, the kit comes in two parts. It comes with some kind of second offcut stones and the idea is that you would make a wrist mala as a practice um, to get used to tying the knots. And then um, some main beads um, for actually making the full mala for yourself after you've done your practice one. But I have to say, some of these stones are so pretty, I'm going to pick them out and use them in my full mala, even though they may not be, you know, perfect quality um, or whatever. Imperfection is a part of life. Um, and my friend picked out, uh, I think she got to specify which stones she wanted to include. And so my kit um, includes Red River Jasper, which are these red beads. Um, and they also, I think, come in this more gray color here that's on this strand. And uh, these are a stone of endurance resonating with the earth. Um, and I don't have any earth in my astrology chart. So if you pull in elementals um, from either uh, from other studies, you kind of get to know yourself as a person. Um, and so definitely using some earth energy would be helpful. Um, stimulating your life force, your stamina, your strength, your vitality uh, and potency. And I think for me, what I could really use is just that, that um, follow through in some of my projects. So that's helpful. Um, and then the other main one is this uh, adventuring. 
um, which is really beautiful. It sort of re resembles um, a stone that's often uh, sold as jade, um, but it's darker. And this one is for um, unselfish love, uh, gratitude, protection, compassion, joy, uh, spiritual evolution, and so forth. And, um, you know, that really resonates with this idea of cultivate, cultivating bodhicitta as a central practice of uh, Buddhism and particular to the lineage that I'm going to be studying with um, over the course of this next year. Um, you know, it's a great tie-in with that. So, spot on thank you again friend um i also wanted to mention that this kit um, comes with an oracle card and this is the particular one that i got so it says uh maintain your childlike spirit um which is just perfect for you know water child um <clears throat> being the theme here so with the theme of this channel um, so whatever you're diving into uh it's a good reminder to just you know take it with joy um and don't take yourself so seriously maybe which i can i can definitely uh use that reminder it's a good one all right so i will try to put all this away without spilling anything so yeah what a great gift um and a really cool thing to get for someone uh that isn't necessarily looking for stuff for stuff's sake i think my friend really understands where i'm coming from so thank you again um the other things I received were from family, and no surprise here, we have tarot and oracle cards. Um, actually, maybe a little bit of a surprise with the oracle cards, because I've said before that I'm really trying to avoid collecting oracle cards. Um, however, I did put these on my wish list just because I think they're so cute um, and so cool, and they sort of serve a function that I can get behind. Um, so we'll talk about those first. Uh, the first one is more Halloween than, you know... Um, or Samhain themed uh, versus maybe, you know, the end of the year. Um, but these just came out. They're the Bat's Blood Ink Oracle Cards by Monica Bodersky. She um, created the Shadowlands Tarot and it has, uh, you know, her very distinctive art style, um, which, you know, I would say reminds me of Tim Burton. I don't think it's in any way a knockoff of um, Tim Burton's art style, but certainly, you know, there are there are elements to her goofy little creatures that sort of remind me of um, of his creations. Tim Burton, Edward Gorey, you know, it's kind of in that spook, spooky, melancholy, but with a twist, with with a funny um, element to it. So, you know, I I can so appreciate this. And the other thing I like about this deck, as well as the other Oracle deck. Um, that I've received is that these don't have any words on them. So these are numbered. Um, so if you got a certain reading, you could write down the numbers um, and keep track of them that way. But um, they don't have any keywords. So the interpretation is really up to you as to what each one means, um, either on its own or in the context of a larger reading. So I, I really like these a lot, and I like that they're small. Um, they sort of feel the Normandy, but there's there's more of them. Um, so you could do a bigger reading. Um, you can do them with, you know, with another deck maybe for Halloween. Or just, you know, do a draw. Ask a question and, and draw a couple of cards um, and see, see what you think. So I don't know... Um, I was a bad uh, YouTube host and didn't look up ahead of time to see um, if these are available, um, but if they are, I will link them down below. So again, that's the Bat's Blood Ink Oracle deck from Monica Bodersky. And then the other Oracle deck I received is this one, and this is a Stitches Oracle. Um, this Oracle deck and this Yarn Tarot both have to do with fiber arts, fabrics, um, and that kind of thing. And it's something that I have been passionate about for a long time. Not so much sewing. Um, sewing and I don't really get along. I know how to sew, but I tend to, you know, draw blood anytime I try to do a sewing project. Um, but I do like sewing as a metaphor for life. Um, and so let's have a quick look. We have um, knitting and crochet needles here. And this sort of reminds me of the Three of Swords. But um, again, this is just an open Oracle deck. And... So it is not 
tied to a particular structure the way that tarot is. Um, and I can do a full walkthrough on these, but I just wanted to give you an overview today. So the Stitches Oracle, and let's see, this is by Don't you love it when the author puts their name on their products? Stitch Together Studios. I can't, oh, Kiana Nelson. Okay, that's the artist, Kiana Nelson. Um, so I will uh, put this link below, but it's Stitch, Stitch Together Studio.com. And it comes in a nice tuck box. Um, linen cardstock, which I like. I like the black and gold here and sort of the the phases of the moon with balls of yarn and um, you know it sort of blends Halloween and kind of stitching together you have this little skull um, who's being used as like a pin cushion up here on all the cards so it sort of blends this like um, practical magic thing in with um, stitching and embroidery and, and knitting and all of this so it's pretty fun so here are a few of the cards you can see there's a lot of knitting theme stuff but again no keywords no text on here so it's really up to you um, as to how you're going to interpret each of these cards some of them sort of look like they could be tarot cards to me um, but then some really don't you know seem to have any particular correspondence and you do get a mix of you know things that are maybe neutral in tone uh, this one might be a little bit more, um, you know, challenging or difficult uh, scenes where you're being protected or, you know, maybe uh, practicing the craft correctly and then versus maybe something, you know, something unfortunate happening or some challenge arising. Uh, moths would definitely be a challenge in the context of having a collection of wool and knitted goods and then moths come in and eat everything. Um, so yeah, you know, mending, repairing, um, there's all kinds of cool metaphors I think that you can, that you could read into these. Um, and again, this seems like it would be a good deck to, to answer questions or to look at, you know, the energy of a situation, possibly in conjunction with a tarot reading. Um, so that's really cool. Again, I love the the palette. It's just this kind of um, textured gray background and then gold and black ink. Very simple um, and could work with with a lot of other decks as well. So that's super cool. And it came with this fun sticker, which I haven't decided what to do with, but I will definitely do something with it. And then the, the third deck is the yarn tarot and this is one that I saw I can't remember where maybe somebody got an advanced copy on Instagram or something like that or maybe it just came up on Amazon because it knew I was looking at tarot decks um, but this is published by Sixth and Spring Books um, it's illustrated by someone named Katie Ponder P-O-N-D-E-R and it says it's a yarn tarot for crocheters, knitters, spinners, and weavers. And so that's reflected into the, the four suits that we have. It comes in one of these overhand boxes. Um, it comes with a nice little hardbound book um, that is in black and white. It's got about 72 pages or so. It uh, has a little paragraph on each one. Um, and description of how to shuffle, some ideas for spreads. So yeah, it's got it's got a few different things: week ahead, year ahead, Celtic classic cross, all that. So yeah, not a bad little introduction to the tarot. Um, I like that the inner box is decorated with all of the suits, so that's cool. And then the cards themselves, let's see if we can rearrange things here. Uh, the cards themselves look like this. So there are the backs. Um, this is a nice cardstock. It's not too thick, not too thin. 
Uh, it is nice and flexible and it does it seems like it's plasticized like not just coated with plastic but impregnated with plastic which I like because um, it means that the cards will be very durable and they won't uh, get a bow in them very easily so and I have seen walkthroughs of this deck so I'm not going to walk through the whole thing uh, I'll try to find one and link it below but here are the cards it's got this flat sort of vectorized image quality um, I will say that the outfits and the textiles are very on point as they should be in a deck that's textile themed and you do get some different diversities in terms of the way that people look and their body shape, uh, their gender presentation, and things like that. You also get sort of female characters in traditionally male roles, like this is the Hierophant um, with a more feminine looking figure there. So yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. I like it. I like this Hermit card. He's cool. Um, and so maybe I will do a more detailed, I might do a more detailed walkthrough just because I have some uh, some thoughts and comments on, on the deck as well. Um, but just a fun one to have uh, for any sort of fiber enthusiast in your life. Um, one thing I do want to point out is that the pip cards, um, the numbered cards, are actually more pippish than they are like a Rider Waite Smith. So you get very Rider Waite Smith imagery in the majors and then in the uh, numbered cards, you tend to just get hands or you know minimal, minimal figure representation until you get to the courts. So if you don't like pip decks or they're off-putting to you, um, this may not be a deck for you. Um, even though you know, I think if you looked at a Rider Waite Smith and you were familiar with it, you would see this as the Three of Pentacles anyway, um, because it's in this archway, um, like the Rider Waite Smith card. But then you get to this, and it's like, you know, it is it is similar, and it's also different. Um, so yeah, that's. But like, look, cabled sweater and a scarf and a hat. This is like what every knitter looks like when they go to a yarn festival. They have to put on every single piece of handmade clothing that they've ever made, even if it doesn't go together. This person has a very coordinated outfit on. Um, but, you know, it's just, I call it like the knitterly hobo look where you've got like every piece of clothing you've ever, you've ever handmade on at the same time. Um, yeah, it's pretty funny. Anyway, that you get the idea of that. It's it's super sweet and and I really like it. So thank you, uh, family members, for getting me these. Um, they will definitely be put into use. And I also think uh, decks like this are nice because you know they're they're good to have in the collection. They're more modern and they're not as scary um, as some traditional tarot imagery, and that's always a good thing to have. Now I accidentally. Um, somehow received a second copy of this. I think there was somehow a double order when my partner got this for me, so I will be doing a giveaway of this. Um, but yeah, I think this will be just a separate video um, in order to kind of delve a little bit more in and then also give this one away. So look for that in January. Um, let's see what else I wanted to talk about. Next, I think we're going to talk about books. Um, one of my goals uh, lately and sort of habits I'm trying to cultivate is just to read more in general. Um, like I said, I do read articles and things, but in terms of reading books, I'm, I'm not so great at it um, or haven't been. And so um, I started off my sort of book book reading cultivation back in November. I read a, a fiction piece by a friend of a friend um, as kind of a, a second reader um, for that. And um, then I went back and picked up this book, which um, I've been a bad white lady and have not been reading my anti-racist books that I purchased. Um, with the intention of reading them but you know then it's it's like it's very easy to excuse yourself um and not actually finish these things so i did go back and finish this book and it is excellent and i can highly recommend it um if you are a white person and you're worried about getting called out about like, trying to examine these difficult topics that um you know you didn't realize you had uh certain prejudices or things inside yourself and you're afraid to confront them um, or you're worried that maybe your upbringing 
didn't give you the skills and the tools to deal um, with some of the things that I think we're all trying to face right now as a country, um, this is a really good book and it is told from the author's own perspective. So here you have a black man in America who's dealing with his own internalized racism and his own prejudices and his own homophobia and his own sexism. And for me, that just opened up a door because it's like, okay, if this guy um, who maybe in my mind I felt like I was supposed to feel sorry for or something, something like that, something I've been trained and taught to do, if he can write a book about this topic from uh it covers his own personal experiences growing up and um addresses uh this kind of habitual thinking in a really clear and affirming way um with very practical advice for what to do um then i think anybody you know anybody can approach this really um so i think it's just it's because it's told from that personal perspective um it's really great. It doesn't feel like someone's standing over you saying, you're a racist, you're a bad person, uh, you need to do better, um, which is probably all true. But as we know, white fragility is a very powerful force and um, it can kind of, it can be so loud that it's hard to hear underneath it the voice that says, you know, you could work on this stuff and it, it you would feel better if you did it. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to read a quick excerpt uh, for you because I'm also um, kind of intrigued by the way that uh, Dr. Kendi expresses some of his ideas in this book and how it, um, how it ties back into what I've been learning in my Buddhism class. Um, which is, you know, the central pra core practice of Buddhism um, is about viewing everyone equitably and everyone deserves um, kindness, understanding, and uh, compassion. And so this is uh, from his chapter called Class because, again, uh, anti-racism work is not just about racism. It's about the intersectionality between all types of oppression um, and uh and so, you know, he has different chapters on class and gender and, and all of this. Um, so he says, uh, when we racialize classes, support racist policies against those race classes and justify them by racist ideas, we are engaging in class racism. To be anti-racist is to equalize the race classes. To be anti-racist is to root the economic disparities between the equal race classes in policies, not people. So it's about policies, not about individual behaviors. To be anti-racist is to say the political and economic conditions, not the people in poor black neighborhoods are pathological. Pathological conditions are making the residents sicker and poorer while they strive to survive and thrive, while they invent and reinvent cultures and behaviors that may be different, but never inferior to those of residents in richer neighborhoods. But if the elite race classes are judging the poor race classes by their own cultural and behavioral norms, then the poor race classes appear inferior. Whoever creates the norm creates the hierarchy and positions their own race class at the top of the hierarchy. And that's human nature. Um, to see myself as better than anybody else, right? It's a pride, it's a pride thing. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is this just ties in so well to that idea of equanimity and equality that I'm learning in Buddhism. Um, and it's not that these concepts are totally unfamiliar uh, to me. I was raised by, you know, fairly liberal-minded um, middle-class white people, but uh I just found it so um, interesting and grounding and comforting in a way that that all of that stuff comes up in this book as well. So again, go out, buy your anti-racism book and read it. Um, I encourage you to do that. And um, so I finished that book in December and I've started a new book that I got um, also as a gift. And this is called Music is History. It's by Questlove. Um, if you don't know him, he's the leader of the band The Roots. Um, but he is also an amazing music historian, or historian in general, I would say, but a historian rooted in music. And so it makes sense that um, 
that his book is all about the intersection of music with history. Um, and it's told, again, from a personal perspective. Um, it is told chronologically through Questlove's own life. So each year he talks about major events in history. It starts in 1971 when he was born. Um, and then talks about sort of key songs that represent something about what happened in that year, either for himself or on a world stage or some combination. Um, this book in some ways reminds me of a book called Songbook, uh, written by a British author, Nick Hornby, that I read years ago. And again, it was like a personal reflection, kind of a personal, you know, top 10 list or something about about songs that um, were tied to him emotionally or that he associated with memories or big events in his life. Um, but this is cool because it's not just personal. It's also about history, particularly black history. So I'm learning so much. Um, and he's hilarious. Um, he's got a great sense of humor that is very relatable. So <laughs> um, it's funny because my, my husband got me this book and, you know, I just sit in the room, other room and I like cackle occasionally and goes, I'm glad you're liking your book. So highly recommend that one as well. Again, Music is History by Questlove. So that kind of covers new decks, gifts, and then also reading. Um, and then for 2022, um, I did do a card of the year reading on my card, The Chariot. So I'll link that video below and you can check it out. Um, that was an interesting, uh, an interesting reading um, that I received. And I liked that it sort of forced me to look at my Buddhist practice and some of my personal goals for the year, rather than being so focused on work. Um, I mentioned in my November Reflections video that I'm I've applied for a promotion, and I don't know what the end result of that was. I was hoping I'd find out before break, um, but they've had some delays in, uh, I guess, making that decision or making it final. And so I've got this note um, that said, you know, thanks for thanks for being patient with us while we make this decision. Um, and I'm okay with that. I think patience is also one of the big uh, lessons I've had to learn over the last year, year and a half um in in multiple areas of my life so i've just been sitting with that and saying yep yeah, it's okay i can wait there's really no rush for this um but in the meantime i'm glad that my that my personal card of the year reading um helped me you know look at that chariot card not just in a, a work or um, career sense but also in a personal sense and so i wanted to share with you some other kind of personal habits and things that i've been trying to cultivate and things I'm working on for this year. And uh, first I'll just show you my little montage of favorite things. And uh, you can guess what my favorite color is. And um, the first guess doesn't count. <laughs> um, but uh, so yeah, so I got this journal. Um, it, it's a journal, it's a planner, who knows. Um, but I'm gonna use it mostly as a journal. Um, for this year. I got this um, last month and I've been working at it a little bit um, and I think I showed you a lot of these layouts. So this is uh, the, it's it's kind of a year at a glance or a, or a couple, four months at a glance. So December, January, February, and March and then you have all the days here. I'm using this as a habit tracker. So you can see here I have meditation, exercise, and reading. Um, and here you can put a little dot or check mark or something if you do that every day. Um, but I mentioned that I did want to also write down what I did every day. So not just did I do some meditation, but what kind or how many pages did I read or what book am I on? And so I was playing around with a, a different version of that in this little um, just a little notebook um, because it was December and my my regular um, journal hasn't started yet. It starts in January. So I was trying that out and I think I am going to do the, sort of this part at the top of each page and then I'll still do the dot to kind of give myself a gold star for each day because it'll be nice to look back um, in here and just kind of see my trends and what I've been doing. Um, so yeah, so that'll happen at the top of each page here. And I still haven't entirely figured out what I'm doing with the monthly layouts here. So if you use a, a personal planner, let me know. 
Um, I do use a digital um, calendar for like appointments and reminders, and I don't want to duplicate that here. But so for December, what I do have is some to do items over here. I have important um, birthdays and, you know, when I was on winter break um, for work and um, maybe just some fun uh, social events that I wanted to remember next year. Because one thing I've noticed is that I don't really go back and reflect on my year and I don't look and say, oh, right, I had lunch with that person or this is when I met this person and our friendship started, um, that kind of thing. So I'd like to do, I'd like to have a way to capture those fun personal events and look back on them, um, even though I'm not really using this as a schedule. It's more of like a memory keeping device. Um, but like I said, if you have if you have suggestions on like a monthly spread for personal stuff, I guess I could do like a motivational word of the day or just a, you know, a quick one or two word reflection of, of how my day was. Um, some people give themselves a rating on their day and I find that very like, oh, <laughs> like it's more than just tracking your habits. It's like I was a good person today or I was not a good person. That's I don't know. It feels too judgy. So I won't be doing that. Um, Anyway, so there's that. And then this uh, notebook actually had um, January, February, and March of 2023, the next year. And I decided I didn't need those monthly spreads. So I'm just going to use this as a place to document uh, what I want to talk about in these monthly updates. So for January's reflections video, I know I'll have an update on my job. And so I can mention something about that. And I don't know what February, March, April, whatever, um, but because it was three, um, uh, three months of pages, I can split each into two and get six, um, six entries in here. So that's what I'm going to use this section for is, is to remind myself. Here's where I'm going to put that card of the year reading uh, that I did um, and some notes about it and reminders and hopefully leave space so that I can continue to add through it as the year progresses. And then the thing I don't know what I'm going to do with is this page. Um, it says coming up and I was thinking of using it more as a personal reflections page for the month. Not something, not a cue for what to talk about in these videos, but just for my own uh, introspection. So that might be true. It might be plans or, you know, what my ideal January looks like. Um, I haven't decided, but then, you know, these pages are all going to be just um, kind of doodles and uh, and stuff like that, you know, or or short writings. So, you know, even if it's something like this, um, just to like play around with markers and or do something creative every day um, and it does not have to be fancy. So there's that. Um, and then while I went down the YouTube poll that is like uh, planning and journaling and all of that, um, I did find some cool ideas for work planning. Um, so my challenge with work planning is that I tend to take a lot of notes. I take a lot of notes in meetings. I take notes when I do training. Um, either somebody teaching me something or when I'm training somebody else, I will often write down notes of what we talked about. Um, so I need one place to keep kind of notes and also running to-do list. I use paper, pen and paper for my to-do list. So um, I thought I would get a planner and try to use this to contain all of my notes in one place rather than having them sprinkled around in multiple notebooks, post-it notes, etc., etc. So here is um, my planner. Here's some, I've gotten into multi-pens lately. Um, this actually, this journal set came with this pen. Hobonichi comes with a pen every year. So, um, so this got me turned on to like, oh, right. These were fun when I was in middle school. Why don't, why don't I continue to use this? And I like this pen a lot. It's made by Uni and it's a Uni Jetstream, uh, pen. They also make single, um, single color pens if you don't like the thickness of a multi pen but it writes really smoothly um, and the ink dries really quickly which is nice because I'm left-handed and I often smear my ink um, the other pen that I've been really fun having fun with is this one this is by Pilot and it's called a friction pen and the cool thing about this one is that it does erase and it doesn't leave like stuff debris residue all over the place so you can write in it and then you can use this 
kind of hard rubberized plastic tip and it doesn't wear this down. What it does is, is it uses the heat um, to change and remove the pigment from the ink. And it does a really good job uh, without like damaging the paper or taking the ink off the existing paper because that's not written in this kind of special disappearing ink. So that's been pretty fun. Um, and it helps me because I don't like, I don't like it when I make a spelling mistake or leave a word out and I can't fix it without having to use, um, you know, correction tape or something like that. Um, so this helps me be just less like cranky at work when I'm taking notes. Uh, so, um, this is my work planner. Um, it's a Wonderland 222. It's in this custom cover that I bought off of Etsy. Um, it's reusable. And this is um, kind of the layout of this planner. You can see more detailed layouts in other videos, I'm sure. Um, one thing I liked about this uh, planner is that, um, first of all, the pages are all numbered. So you can, uh, and it has index pages, so you can refer back to your notes. Um, something else I liked was this quarterly layout. And I'm thinking that if I get the more technical position, I'll use this for keeping statistics because that job will entail um, tracking things on a daily and weekly basis. So I can jot down some statistics here in these months and then I can also write out um, more kind of qualitative assessments of things over here. So that's the quarterly layout section. Then we get into um, what would be trackers. Um, but I don't, uh, I don't use trackers at work. So I don't have things that I need to do in order to remind me to do my job or remind me to do my daily habits at work. So I have printed out just dot grid and I've plastered over. You can kind of still see the shadow of those tracker pages underneath, but this just gives me a blank slate to write on. Um, I do have some things in the front here, like global task lists that I will um, eventually write on here. But again, it depends on which job I have. So um, we'll see how that goes. And then getting into um, the planner itself. So it does come with monthly layouts. And that's what this looks like. And I'm using this to track my time off and when other people are time have time off so that I can make sure if I need to do something specific while they're out um, that I can remember when they have time off. And then the weekly, um, the weekly spreads look like this. So I try just regular weekly spread. Um, and I didn't have a lot going on this week, but so you can see here at the top, there's like blank space. And then this, most of the page is taken up with a timeline so that you could put in, you know, all your meetings, or if you like to time block for yourself, like I'm going to work on this project at 10 o'clock. I'm going to return this phone call at 1130. I'm going to go to lunch from 1130 to 1230. And I'm going to, you know, work on this other project starting at two. Um, you could plug those things in, but A, we use a digital calendar at work to coordinate all of our meetings. So I don't need to copy all that down in a paper book. I can just look at it on my computer. Um, and then the other thing is that I don't block out my time that way. Um, I manage to get my to-do list done in just by working at it throughout the week. Um, and I do think of my to-do list and my tasks on a weekly basis. So that's why I chose a planner with weekly layouts rather than daily ones. So I tried that. Um, then I tried plugging stuff in. Um, so I have here like to-dos on specific days um, that I need to do them and that was okay, but it still felt like I was wasting space and trying to cram my to-do list down in, the, in the, the very bottom of these pages. Um, and then I saw some videos on other planner layouts that I liked better than this. So one is called the Nolte Planner and they have, uh, Nolte is a Japanese company and they make dozens of planner layouts, but I will, um, link to the specific one that I liked. 
it's this one that has um, a, a week. It still has a weekly layout. It has the small boxes at the top of the screen, but then it just has open grid below. So you could put a few day specific things on the days that you need to do them, whether that's reminders or whatever, but then below you get all this free open space to make whatever list you want or reminders or to do's or take meeting notes, which is really what I want. Um, and you know, I'd already invested in this Wonderland 222 planner. It's not cheap. So what I decided to do was take that layout and kind of adapt it into this planner. So the next week, you can see here what I did was I um, just drew a line uh, under a certain portion of this timeline thing. I wrote in the hours um, that I work, which is usually eight to four. And then I did put in a few time sensitive items, um, but then the rest of the page becomes, you know, tracking my to do's and taking meeting minutes, uh, which is this section over here is just from two meetings that I tend to have on Thursdays. So that was better. And then the next week it got even better because I, over here, I had already written all this stuff kind of crammed in the bottom of the page. So this was this week again. I still wrote in the numbers, but I didn't write in all the numbers. I wrote in the even numbers. So um, that looks less cluttered. And then here I just have more space for my to-dos and then more space um, for my like waiting on, waiting for people to get back to me or to for people to make a decision so I can move forward. So that's how I'm using this book. Um, it does come with a generous amount of pages in the back that are basically blank grid. They have a timeline here. So I guess you could use this as daily pages, but there's only about 80 of them or 74, something like that. So um, you wouldn't be able to use like a page per work day, um, but that's okay because I don't, I don't necessarily need a whole page for every day. Um, the other thing that this book comes with is monthly review pages and then month ahead pages. So here, for example, you have your August review page and then your September overview. And I, again, I don't really think about my work in a monthly sense. I tend to break it down by week. So what I'm using these for also is uh, meeting notes or um, project tracking or that kind of thing. So I have a, a monthly meeting with my boss, for example, that is probably going to go on the overview page for each month. So it's just the priorities and the things that we talk about in those one-on-one -on -one meetings um, that gets its own page. Um, you know, the review page could be for any meeting or any project that I'm working on for that month. So um, I do in that sense get 24 more pages, but um, if you needed more, then you could even go with, you know, a separate notebook um, that you could slip into the back um, and kind of carry those things together. So that's the planner that I've um, been using so far. I've only really been using this for a month. So we'll see how that plays out through the rest of the year. But I think I can adapt this pretty well um, to the way that I like to work. And you know, for 2023, I'll probably either go with the Nolte planner that I mentioned. Um, they also make one that instead of grid below is like a timeline below, but it's very faint and it could almost be like a lined notebook. So I'm trying to decide whether I'd want to go with grid or lined. And I think I'll figure that out as, as this year goes on. Um, there is a third company called Luddite, I think, which is hilarious um, when you think about like Luddites being people who don't want to use technology and instead like insist on keeping everything on paper rather than using their computer. Um, but they have a, what they call a freeform layout and it's similar to the Nulti, but it has even fewer kind of extra pages. It doesn't have um, any trackers. It doesn't have extra months or weeks. It's an undated planner, so you could use start it at any time. You don't have to start on January 1st. And um, it just has the 12 months and the 52 weeks and then a little bit of notebook paper at the end. So um, probably either the Nulti or this Luddite planner would be what I go with um, in 2023, which is weird to think about because as I'm recording this, it's uh, it's New Year's Eve 2021 into 2022, but I don't know. I just, I love to research things and I love options. So, you know, that's, that's how I roll. <laughs> uh, but anyway, if you, um, if you do any planning or prep work, especially around work 
and managing kind of work tasks, um, routines and that kind of thing. Let me know what works for you in the comments below. I would love to hear about that. And uh, thank you for being with me on this kind of rambling video. I hope you're all well. I hope you have a safe and wonderful, happy new year. And I will see you all very, again very soon. Take care.